probably has or, if not, will touch many of us in, in the audience. It, it's interesting, when you read the papers and the media and the TV, we're, we're constantly being told about all the things that are not good for us, you know, the, the things that we eat, the things that we drink, the things that we do, all, all of these have a really deleterious effect on, on, our, uh, on our health. And yet, and I'm sure there's an element of truth in that, of course, and yet the facts actually are quite clear. Life expectancy is increasing. We are getting older and older. Now, there are some highly predictable um, implications for an increase in life expectancy. Um, one is that if you've got anything to do with a pension fund, it means that your deficit gets even larger. And as the honorary treasurer, I know all about that. Another thing, of course, is that the older you get, then the greater the incidence of the diseases of old age. And one of the most serious and um, devastating diseases of old age that we can experience is of course Alzheimer's disease and that is the subject of, of tonight's uh, lecture. Um, Alzheimer's disease treatments and tests on the horizon by uh, Simon Lovestone who's the professor of old age psychiatry at King's College London. There are currently 750,000 people diagnosed with dementia in the UK today and that's estimated to reach a million by 2025. So this is a significant issue. It costs the country £17 billion per year to look after these people, which is more than people with cancer and heart diseases combined. So it's horrible and it's very, very costly. This lecture by, uh, by Simon will show how current research in dementia holds great promise both in trying to understand the mechanisms to find new treatments and in researching biomarkers to help identify the condition at an earlier stage. So that's what Simon's going to talk about now. I'll just give you a, a, a brief bio of Simon himself. Simon is Professor of Old Age Psychiatry at the Institute of Psychiatry in King's College London and he's the, the Director of the NAHR Biomedical Research Centre for Mental Health at the South London and Morsley NHS Trust and the Institute of Psychiatry. He studied microbiology um, at Sheffield University and then medicine at Southampton University and has continued to practice both medicine and molecular science and that combination of the, the, the scientist clinician is really really important um, to make progress in, in, in these sorts of diseases and he's been doing that ever since uh, um, after working as a junior doctor in medicine uh, and in healthcare of the elderly, he trained in psychiatry and then obtained a Wellcome Trust Fellowship to study the molecular relationship between plaque and tangles in Alzheimer's disease. And I'm sure you'll find out what plaque and tangles actually are in, in due course. Um, he has an MPhil in psychiatry for his research. Uh, um, actually on the mental health of new fathers and a PhD in biochemistry resulting from his Wellcome Trust Fellowship. He became a senior lecturer and then a reader in old age psychiatry and neuroscience before becoming professor at the Institute and consultant on old age, he is the consultant old age psychiatrist at the Morsley Hospital. In addition to heading a multidisciplinary old age psychiatry clinical team, he has clinical interests in dementias and in genetic counselling. He's director of the NIHR Biomedical Research Centre for Mental Health, founded in 2007. He's deputy director of the MRC Centre for Neurodegener Neurodegeneration Research chairman of the scientific advisory board of the Alzheimer's Research Trust and has been a member of the Wellcome Trust Neurosciences panel and part of the MRC College of Experts. So I think we're very, very fortunate tonight in having one of the country's leading scientific experts on Alzheimer's disease. And I would ask Simon to come up now and uh, give us his talk. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you. It's May the 8th, 1945. 
VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. Churchill announces the end of the war. Peace breaks out in Europe. This is London. There would have been celebrations. We're English, and so there would have been beer in pint pots and gin in teacups. Huge celebrations in the streets. So can you imagine the crowds just outside of here in Piccadilly? There were handsome men in uniform. Husbands were due to come back from the war. Lovers were reunited. What do you think happened next? <laughs> Nine months later, a baby was born. And in February 1946, the baby boomer generation started. And soon after that baby, there was another, and then another, and then another for 15 glorious years, right up, incidentally, to my birthday in February uh, 1961. I missed out on the baby boomer generation by two sorry weeks. And what a blessed generation they were. They lived through times initially of hardship and then of great wealth. Um, and the population increased, and it increased dramatically. The UK, the rest of Europe, and indeed many other parts of the world, Australia and America, saw a huge rise in the population. And of course, that population are now becoming older. Because almost exactly a year ago, the first of the baby boomer generation became a silver surfer. They acquired a bus pass and a pension. And for the next 15 years, we will see in the Western countries a substantial increase in the numbers of elderly. I mean, really, very substantial indeed. And this is going to have huge implications for us. For those of you that are uh, considerably younger than I in the audience, I can't help but feel a bit sorry for you because in 15 years or so I will be retiring and it's going to be your salaries that keeps me uh, with my pension as small as it may be. So this is the population structure and you can see the change in the population over this sort of period from on the left hand side these population graphs are frequency by different age range. And on the right hand side, you can see how the numbers of older people increase. And the pyramid, which is what it should be, starts to become increasingly inverted. And this is really a very substantial challenge for our populations because 5% of people over age 65 have dementia. Between 20 and 50% of people over 85 have dementia. It's an extraordinary figure. And it has huge implications. As Peter said, by 2050, we will have more than a million people in our small island with dementia. The costs of this are extraordinary. In fact, it's more than 20 billion pounds today. There was a time when if you, I mean just very recently, two or three years ago, when saying those kind of figures, 20 billion pounds, it sounds like an implausible number, almost impossible to imagine. Well, the bankers managed to imagine it. They managed to lose that and more. But nonetheless, it is still a large amount of money. And I would say it's unsustainable because that amount of money to provide care for people with dementia is, as Peter said, greater than the amount of money that's required for people with cancer and heart disease together. If you were to turn the amount of money that it costs to look after people with dementia into turnover of a company, that company would be twice the size of ExxonMobil. 
This is a huge amount of money, and I would like to suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that it is an unsustainable amount of money, and that we simply cannot afford to provide the care that we currently provide for people with dementia, if that number of a million and then more after 2050 is realised. So we have an absolute imperative to do something about it. Now the good news is, is that there are treatments and indeed tests on the horizon. And so what I'm going to do this evening is tell you a little bit about the prospects for disease modification therapy. So I'm going to make a contrast between the kinds of therapies that are available now that you may have heard about, drugs like Aricept or Dinepazil and there's a variety of others. These drugs just treat the symptoms of people with Alzheimer's disease and treating the symptoms is good, but they offer really very, very modest benefit indeed and then only for a short time. What I'm interested in doing is working towards finding a therapeutic approach that would actually modify the biology, potentially be preventative. And I'm going to discuss a little bit about why we aren't closer to that goal uh, than we might have been. So the story starts a hundred years ago with Alzheimer himself and in effect his first patient, her name was Augusta Dieter. And he wrote, Alzheimer wrote, the most exquisite notes about Augusta's illness. Um, these notes were discovered a, a relatively short time ago. I'll read this out to you. I think it's quite moving, really. She sits on the bed with a helpless expression. What is your name? Augusta. Your last name? Augusta. What is your husband's name? Augusta, I think. Your husband? Ah, my husband. She looks as if she didn't understand the question. Are you married to Augusta? Mrs. D. Yes, yes, Augusta D. How long have you been here? She seems to be trying to remember. Three weeks. What is this? I show her a pencil. A pen. A purse, a key, a diary, a cigar. Those are the days. Are all identified correctly. At lunch, she eats cauliflower and pork. Asked what she is eating, she answers spinach. So you can see the confusion, I think. And this is the confusion that I see in my patients. You can see a number of things in these careful notes. The repetitive answers to the questions. It's something, symptom that's called perseveration. The misidentification of objects, not really recognizing the nature of the question that she's being asked. It's a terrifying disease. Uh, we, of course, are terrified about acquiring it, our relatives acquiring it. And certainly in the early stages, when you're aware of what's happening, it must be a terrifying experience to have. Sometimes relatives say that the only blessing of this disease is that you lack the ability to understand what's happening to you really rather quickly indeed. Augusta died, and Alzheimer uh, acquired her brain at post-mortem, and he performed the most careful examinations of it. This is what he wrote in the notes. In the center of an otherwise almost normal cell, he's referring now to a brain cell, a neuron, stands out one or several fibrils due to their characteristic thickness and peculiar impregnability. And this is his drawing of them. And we know these now to be neurofibrillary tangles. And later on in the talk, I'll tell you what they're made of and how we're trying to design novel therapeutic agents to these. He also said, numerous small millary foci are found in the superior layers. They are determined by the storage of a peculiar material in the cortex. And indeed, what a material peculiar material it is. And most of what we know about Alzheimer's disease, most of the advances that have been made over the past 20 years or so, have been advances made in that peculiar material that Alzheimer was so perceptive to identify. So these are the two pathologies that Alzheimer's disease was looking at. This time uh, from a patient of my own some years ago. And on the left-hand side, you see 
what we now know to be the amyloid plaque. And on the right-hand side, you see a selection of neurons, some of which have neurofibrillary tangles in. And I'll come back to those tangles later. For now, I want to tell you a little bit about the amyloid plaque and what it's made of. And this is work that dates back to Glenna and Wong in about 1984, who made the first substantial um, advance after Alzheimer's work. So very carefully, Glenna and Wong, Bayreuther and others, identified, they isolated and then identified the peculiar material. And the peculiar material is a four kilodalton peptide called beta amyloid. Now, as chemists, you'll know, of course, that amyloid is a generic description of a protein aggregation that forms beta-pleated sheets. This is a particular amyloid that comes from a much larger protein called amyloid precursor protein. An amyloid precursor protein is a type 1 transmembranous protein. It sits in the uh, extracellular membrane such that the larger part of the protein sits outside of the cell, the smaller part of the protein sits on the inside of the cell. And the beta amyloid peptide straddles the membrane. In Alzheimer's disease, and in fact in your brains, the amyloid peptide is metabolized. It comes out of the amyloid precursor protein, and it tends to self-aggregate. It's a highly sticky peptide. self-aggregates in an Eppendorf tube, and it self-aggregates presumably in the brain. So the first task, then, is to understand that metabolism of amyloid precursor protein and how it is that, that the beta amyloid peptide is removed, cut out of, the amyloid precursor protein. We now know that there are three major uh, secretases, beta secretase, alpha secretase, and gamma secretase. And it is the beta secretase cut and the gamma secretase cut sequentially that is what uh, produces the beta amyloid moiety itself. So understanding the beta secretase and the gamma secretase becomes then critical to the development of potential disease modification therapies because if you could inhibit them, you would theoretically or conceptually prevent or reduce the amount of beta amyloid production. I remember well uh, at an international conference when uh, the beta secretase gene was first cloned and described. And it was an interesting experience for me because although it was a larger room, perhaps four times as large as this, it was very difficult to get in. It was so crowded. It was so crowded not only with scientists, but with journalists and with um, colleagues from the finance industry. <laughs> uh, it's a remarkable experience for me because it, I, I realized at that moment of the economic import of this discovery. I realized that this was a hugely important discovery for science, of course, but hugely important discovery because this potentially held the key to drug development for, as I've told you, one of the most important diseases that faces modern medicine. <coughs> now, remarkably, it turns out that there are some causes of Alzheimer's disease that are genetic. So some Alzheimer's disease, and this is rare, is caused by genetic mutations in an autosomal dominant fashion. And this is, I think, still one of the most remarkable observations in Alzheimer's disease because it turns out that one of the most predominant causes of familial autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease are mutations in the amyloid precursor protein. That alone was a remarkable finding. But the position of those mutations is extraordinarily close to the sites where the secretases cuts the molecule. This tells us something fantastically powerful. It tells us that the metabolism of amyloid precursor protein, when it goes wrong, is causative of Alzheimer's disease. Even more incredibly, the other, mutate, the other gene mutations in which cause uh, autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease are in two genes, presenilin 1 and presenilin 2, and they are part of the gamma secretase complex.
So it's very, very clear then that at least in some families, a aberration in the metabolism of amyloid precursor protein is absolutely causative of Alzheimer's disease. But that's rare. We did a calculation a while ago that there are no more than 100 people in the UK with this form of Alzheimer's disease. It affects people very early on indeed. It affects people in their 30s or 40s typically. A late form of this kind of Alzheimer's disease affects you when you're as old as 50, which I know for some of you is unimaginably old, but trust me, it comes, it comes. Um, but this is a very rare form of disease. But it, the, the analogy is that the causes of late onset Alzheimer's disease will have a same pathogenic process. And much of drug development and other forms of research in Alzheimer's disease are predicated on that idea. That this is a, and I hesitate to use the word, it's, it's a word that some people use as a natural experiment. But it's an unfortunate example of people who've acquired a disease which affects many of us, but they've acquired it because of a mutation. Thankfully that doesn't uh, happen very often. However, we can then begin to base a drug discovery program for disease modification based on that understanding and hope, but I want to emphasize the point, it's a hope that that um, does it, that, that research pathway that is predicated on early onset autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease will also apply to late onset non-autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. But that remains today a hypothesis. But it's a hypothesis that is being tested because there are at least four approaches to amyloid-based disease modification therapies. So as I've indicated, there are beta secretase inhibitors been developed. There are gamma secretase inhibitors that have been developed. There are approaches to try and prevent the amyloid from aggregating antifibrillogenesis approaches. And perhaps the approaches that are most advanced, and we will hear this year and next of a number of phase three trials that will report on this approach, to try and increase the clearance of amyloid plaques, and those are the immunotherapies. So using both passive and active immunotherapy, there are multiple phase three trials currently underway. We are recruiting uh, to one of those. So all this is hugely promising, promising in terms of delivery on time, on target, of multiple approaches, multiple drug development approaches to therapeutics. Of course, we don't yet know the results of many of these, but let me share with you a little worry I have. It's a little worry that I have, and this is a slightly embarrassing observation, I think, for the community, is that we don't actually know what amyloid precursor protein does. We do know, though, that it is fantastically ubiquitous. So it's present in pretty much every cell of your body, and the process that I've described takes place in normal people, it takes place since you've walked into the room. Some of those processes have taken place in your brain, presumably in some of us more than others. It's also very ubiquitous in the animal kingdom. So it's present in the highest organisms known to uh, biology. Obviously, they're chemists. But it's also known to lower organisms, um, including mice and flies, worms. There's something like amyloid precursor protein in slime mold. It's even present in the lowest organisms that have ever been discovered. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe it's them. <laughs> could be them. It could even be them. Anyway, you, you take your pick. The point is, it's pretty common. Um, and we don't quite know what it does. And I just want to share with you a little concern that we're hurtling towards therapeutics that are designed to alter the metabolism of something that is clearly very, very important indeed, and we don't know what it does. That's not a recipe for confidence. Not to say it's the wrong thing to do. It's just a little concern I have.
And as I say, even the cutting out of the beta amyloid and its aggregation, uh, that too is a normal process. It's not an entirely pathogenic process. But it does happen in some of us more than others. And that has both genetic and environmental influences. So, for instance, head injury increases the amount of amyloid you produce and aggregate in your brain. And head injury is best avoided. Even relatively modest head injury uh, increases your risk of Alzheimer's disease. So that's one environmental influence on amyloid precursor protein metabolism that has a direct influence on incidence of Alzheimer's disease. So we now are beginning to put together a cascade of events, environmental influences, as I've just described, on amyloid precursor protein metabolism, such as head injury, presumably, although we don't actually know this yet, but presumably genes that increase the risk of late onset Alzheimer's disease, like APOE, perhaps like some other genes I'll tell you about in a minute, somehow alter something to do with either the metabolism or the aggregation or the clearance of amyloid, this increases your plaques, increases your tangles, and gives rise to dementia. Now, it might not actually be the plaque itself that does the damage here. It might be the amyloid peptide itself. But for the tangle, I think it's very clear that it is the tangle itself that is damaging. But this is a really nice hypothesis, and everything that we know about Alzheimer's disease can one way or another be fitted into this hypothesis. Every cell biology experiment, pretty much every animal experiment, pretty much, although there are some caveats that we might come back to in discussion if you're interested, fit in with this cascade. This was first described by John Hardy, um, and nothing we have found since refutes that hypothesis. In fact, it's so nice, a hypothesis, that the people who pay attention to amyloid have kind of rather had the ascendancy. Um, and the people that are interested in uh, amyloid, or beta amyloid, or BAP, have become called the Baptists. And the Baptists have become rather evangelical about all of this. Uh, and as I'll show you in, in just a moment, there is another... Um, perhaps a more reticent and quieter religion here, and that is uh, the religion that is interested in the formation of tangles, which are formed from a protein called Tau, the Taoists. And that's, I suppose, the camp I would fall into. And I would say it's a very bad pun, that it does, in fact, take Tau to tangle, and it's really both of these pathologies and how they interact that I'm interested in. So this is a brain from post-mortem of a patient of mine many years ago. More or less, this is a normal pyramidal neuron. You can see here the nucleus, the cell body, dendrites, and the axon that's going up there somewhere. This is a neuron that's beginning to look a little abnormal. Can you see these sort of spots inside? This is a classical neurofibrillary tangle that Alzheimer described as a flame-shaped aggregation. You can imagine this as a, something like a candle flame up the side of that neuron. This neuron is probably no more. There's probably no functioning neuron left here. This is sometimes called a tombstone tangle. It marks the point where a neuron once was. And these neurofibrillary tangles are composed of highly aggregated, highly phosphorylated tau protein. So I want to explain to you a little bit about what tau is now. Forgive me, you're chemists, and I, I know that for chemists, anything as large as a cell is unimaginably uh, complex and big. So forgive me if I describe to you uh, something beyond a molecule. Um, this, is a, this is a neuron, you might recognize it. And for me as a clinician and most of my clinical colleagues, we kind of obsess about this bit of the neuron, the synapse. But actually for me as a molecular biologist, it's not the most interesting bit of the neuron. The most interesting bit of the neuron for me is the axon because neurons are, well, they're frankly ridiculous. They uh, shouldn't have been designed this way. The neuron is the best argument against rational design if you ever want one because they're huge. They're, they're extraordinarily large. Most cells are, what, something like 20 microns in diameter. 
And actually the cell, even a normal cell, has a difficult job getting stuff from one side to another. 20 microns uh, things have to travel. Uh, neurons are, are massive. In your head, they're centimeters. I mean, cent orders of magnitude bigger than another cell. In your leg, you have neurons that are a meter long. Can you imagine a cell that is a meter big? I mean, it, 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 it's ridiculous. It shouldn't have been done this way. I wouldn't have done it um, this way. But it, the cell did a very clever thing. And it adapted a piece of its machinery for a different use to overcome the problem of how do you get stuff from here to here and back again. Because in the synapse, there's very, very little endoplasmic reticulum, the protein machinery or factory of the cell. Most of that's up here. So stuff gets made up here and gets moved down the transport system to be assembled in the neuron. So you have to move an awful lot of stuff a very, very long way. And what the neuron did was to utilize an existing machinery, the microtubule machinery, for a different purpose. So you will remember, as I'm sure you will remember, as I do, those pictures you had to draw at school of the chromosomes or chromatids being pulled apart. And you know you had this kind of structure pulling the chromosomes apart as the cell divides. Well, these things are microtubules. And they're composed of, they're basically polymers of tubulin. And that's what they do in a dividing cell. But in a non-dividing neuron, they acquire an entirely different characteristic. And the characteristic they acquire is instead of being this kind of shape, they become that kind of shape. They're very, very long. You can see here a scanning electron microscope, micrograph of neurofilaments and microtubules. And they're these long structures that go up and down the axon. And these polymers of tubulin are held together. They assume this structure with some neuronal specific microtubule associated proteins. The predominant one of which in axons is a protein called tau. That's what tau does. In effect, I'm exaggerating slightly here, but in effect, tau is one of the things that turns a normal cell, a non-neuronal cell, into a cell with neuronal characteristics. And the way it works is that once these microtubules are formed, there are little vesicles. Can you see that one there? One there? One there and there. And these vesicles are fatty micelles, which are full of stuff that is needed to be transported from here to here. And they're attached to a motor, kinesin for the most part. And that motor is then attached to the microtubules, and it moves the stuff in a process of axonal transport from here to here. So it's rather like a railway system. And the way to think of it is these Vesicles are like the trains with the, um, whatever you call a cargo train, you know, the wagons, I suppose, on the back of the train. And, th and these are the railway lines, the microtubules are the railway lines. And just as in a railway line, the railway line has to be held together by the sleepers, the wooden sleepers. Tau has the function of those wooden sleepers. And that goes very badly wrong in Alzheimer's disease. It's a little bit like trying to go from one part of the country to another when the railway system doesn't work. So it's a little bit like, actually this is being filmed, isn't it? I'll be careful, I won't make my normal joke here. It's like going on a company's railway, which I will now not name the name, that is notoriously bad at getting you from place A to place B. It's as if actually somebody has come along and picked up all of the sleepers on the railway line overnight and the railway no longer functions. And that is what we think happens in Alzheimer's disease. And here's a cartoon of it. These are the microtubules. This is the tau protein. This is the railway line that is functioning very well. And in Alzheimer's disease, the sleepers, the tau protein, come off and they self-aggregate to form neurofibrillary tangles. And key to this process is phosphorylation. So phosphorylation governs the strength at which the tau protein binds to the microtubules. Highly phosphorylated tau binds less. 
And in fact, in the fetus, in the fetal brain, tau is very highly phosphorylated. So if an early fetal brain has tau that is probably not functioning very well. It has neurons that, as a consequence, will not be functioning very well. When you're a very early fetus, that probably doesn't matter very much. In fact, it's probably good to have flexible neurons that are meeting, that are, that are meeting their endpoints that they need to. They're growing. But in an adult, that's very bad news indeed. So about, I suppose, however long ago it was now, about 15 years or so ago, um, I joined Professor Brian Anderson's group at the uh, Institute of Psychiatry in King's College London, and what Brian said to me was, it would be a terribly good idea if we knew what the kinase was that phosphorylated tau. So we set out to try and find it. And the first clue was, came from a colleague of mine, Diane Hanger, I think it was a moment of serendipity. So what Diane was doing was looking in vitro to try and find kinases that phosphorylated tau. And she found a whole series of MAP kinases and others that were effective at phosphorylating tau. And she showed that uh, in, in, uh, in amongst the list, she showed that one, another enzyme, glycogen synthase kinase 3, was also a tau kinase. So at that point, we had a large number of tau kinases. And my modest contribution to this field was to say, well, I wonder whether all of those kinases will phosphorylate tau in cells. So we set up a cell-based system to basically screen kinases for their ability to phosphorylate tau. And we found that GSK3 was, by some considerable margin, by far and away the most effective tau kinase in the cell system that we were looking at. And we went on to replicate that in neurons. Here's an experiment. This is an antibody um, called AT8 that labels highly phosphorylated tau protein. So this is a rat hippocampal neuron in a Petri dish, and that black color is its high level of phosphorylation. It's fetal tau, so it's highly phosphorylated. And this is what happens when you inhibit GSK3. You effectively knock out the tau phosphorylation. You reduce tau phosphorylation very considerably. Actually, that particular experiment was done with a GSK3 inhibitor that you as chemists may be very familiar with. It's called lithium, something that's given to very large numbers of people for bipolar disorder. And lithium is a poor inhibitor of... GSK3 lithium is pretty poor at doing anything, actually. But it is a GSK3 inhibitor, and lithium doesn't do so very many things. It inhibits inositol monophosphatase, and it inhibits GSK3. It has multiple actions because of its downstream effects on those two key signaling pathways. But we think, we wondered, whether GSK3 is really at the heart of this process of tau phosphorylation, and hence at the heart of Alzheimer's disease. So here's one of the experiments where we set out to try and explore that, now in an animal model. And the animal model that we chose in this particular instance was Drosophila. We choose Drosophila for two reasons. The first of those is you can do some exquisite genetic tricks with Drosophila. So the exquisite genetic trick that we used in this case was by using the uas gal 4 system we increased the expression of human tau um, only in motor neurons. So we directed that specifically to motor neurons in the fly. And we also put in um, active GSK3. That's the first reason why we chose Drosophila, because of this exquisite genetic manipulation you can do. The second is it's extraordinarily cheap. <laughs> so to run a Drosophila lab, all you need are some flies a few old-fashioned milk bottles, and some bananas. The bananas don't even have to be ripe. <laughs> so we did this, and this is the result. So this is a normal Drosophila larva. And you can see it crawling along, um, and you can see, I think, its tail flicking up as it has these peristaltic waves of muscle movement down its body. And this is what happens when you put in too much tau, you replicate some effects of neurodegeneration. 
I think you can see the difference. So this is a fly that has the pathology that we're interested in induced only in motor neurons. And you can see that there's a failure of proper peristalsis through that uh, larvae and uh, the tail flick is abnormal. And this was work that was done uh, by Amrit Mudha and she was in my group and she went on to look in the adult animal and this is an experiment using a, um, a phenotype called geotaxis. So she has some flies in that test tube. She connects the two test tubes and then ever so gently wax the flies down to the bottom test tube and then watches them crawl up. And they tend to crawl up the sides of the tube and you count in a certain amount of time how many get to the top of the tube. And it's important for me to say at this point that there were no flies hurt in this experiment. <laughs> I mean afterwards, obviously, <laughs> you can kill them, but you know, hey. So we're able, we have a number of phenotypes here and there isn't time to show you the other phenotypes, but we can also look, because we labeled these proteins we're interested in with green fluorescent protein, we're able to look in the living fly at vesicular transport, axonal transport as it happens. We have multiple phenotypes including molecular phenotypes and phenotypes of axonal transport. And the results were all more or less the same. So this is from the adult animal. And you can see here uh, normal or wild type flies in, in pink and tau transgenics replicating some of the um, characteristics of these neurodegenerative disorders in blue. And this is what happens over the lifespan of a normal fly. They have very short lives, poor things, of 17 days or so. And I'm often reminded when I look at this how like flies, I mean how like people flies are in so many, in so many interesting ways. So this is the equivalent of a toddler and any of you that have had any experiences of toddlers, I know Peter has some experience of toddlers, you know they move around very quickly. So the same as the toddler flies are scurrying around all over the place. This is the equivalent of a teenager. Teenagers uh, spend all of their time in bed or watching the television, they don't do their homework, they never uh, tidy their room, and they never clear up after them. They're lazy, good-for-nothing so-and-sos. Exactly the same as in the fly. You can see there's a real dip here. And then after teenage years, the fly improves a bit until the peak of an adult fly's life when they are at their most intelligent, attractive, articulate, and that if you wanted to know that 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 in the fly is the exact equivalent of 51 years and three months. <laughs> and it's all downhill from there on. But looking at the flies where we've induced pathology, you can see the first half of their life, they're indistinguishable. And the point here is that after about midlife in a tau transgenic fly, they get seriously worse and they're bottoming out here. So we have a phenotype that we can measure, as I say, multiple phenotypes in these animals that we can measure. And in, in this work uh, that Amrit published in Molecular Psychiatry, we went on then to test some GSK3 inhibitors, which is of course why you do the experiment. Oops, I beg your pardon. So these are the control experiments, and if you look at the black line, you see the effect of just putting in tau, and then you see the effect of putting in tau plus GSK3, the phenotype gets worse. And the dark grey bars are when we treat them with GSK3 inhibitors. And you can see we pretty much abolish the pathology. The GSK3 inhibitors we used were lithium and also one that was part of the drug development program from AstraZeneca. So we induce a GSK3 dependent tau induced phenotype and at this stage we can say confidently that we've cured Alzheimer's disease. It's in a fly, but you know, it's progress. And so at this point, I think one could be reasonably optimistic because there are multiple then interventions that are in the drug development pipeline. I've told you about antifibrillization, increased clearance through immunization or immunotherapies, the secretase inhibitors. 
told you about GSK3 inhibitors, and there's many others. We also know that environmental influences like head injury, and there are uh, all sorts of interventions to reduce head injury in boxers and uh, people on bicycles and footballers, but also diabetes increases your risk of this process and helping to um, reduce the incidence of diabetes is a terribly good idea. So all of this is very promising. And there's a journal, um, the Journal of Neurodegenerative Diseases, that does a head count of drugs that are in development for Alzheimer's disease every couple of years or so. And this was the situation in 2008. At that point, there were 682 drugs in development patented for Alzheimer's disease. There were 50 in phase 2 trials, and there were 10 in phase 3 trials. These are the phase 3 trials that were in uh, progress then. That is terrific news, isn't it? A very large drug development program for Alzheimer's disease, based largely on the science that I have tried to summarize for you. That's the good news. The bad news is the first of those phase three trials, the first few of those phase three trials have failed. Oh, you expect phase three failure. That's um, normal. The majority, as you very well know, the majority of phase three trials fail. But we have a very, very serious concern in this field, and I think that I'm not alone in fearing the worst and predicting phase three failure over this year and next as the major trials begin to report. And we collectively in the field are very worried indeed about what effect that will have on further drug development, especially in the pharmaceutical industry. And we have this fear, not just because we're pessimists, because actually I think we're natural optimists, but for some very good and substantial reasons. So what we have come to learn over the past 20 years or so is that Alzheimer's disease has a very long prodromal period. And that is both a challenge and an opportunity. It's unfortunate that now, today, we're in the period of challenge. And it's can we stay with this challenge for long enough to realize the opportunity is a question that at the moment is simply unanswered. So what we do right now is do trials in people with established dementia. Just beginning are trials in a stage of the disease that is called mild cognitive impairment. To be honest, this is recognizable as very early Alzheimer's disease. What we probably need to do, though, are trials in the preclinical period. But if you've been involved in clinical trials, you will look at that with some despair because you'll see the immediate problem. The immediate problem that you'll see is that when you do trials in dementia, they can be relatively short because the slope is so steep. So people are changing quickly. Whatever your outcome measure for the trial, be it cognition or movement to a nursing home or functional impairment, you get changed very quickly over a period of one to two years. And that's the length of a clinical trial. A trial, incidentally, today costs in the region of one to two hundred million dollars. So not, not nothing. But if you want to do a trial in that phase, there's almost no slope. Almost by definition, your trials have to be very, very long. And you have to have more people included because many of them won't go on to get dementia. So your costs go up. And if the costs today are one to 200 million, and we're talking about disease trials, disease modification trials that would have to be at least an order of magnitude bigger, you can see the problem. The problem is we might have to fund trials that will cost many billions of dollars. Now there are trials in some areas that do cost billions of dollars. It's not inconceivable, but it's a hard ask for any single pharmaceutical company, let alone a country. And that's the problem we face today. So there is hope though on the horizon because 
If we could identify people that were actually already in that preclinical phase, if we could identify pathological processes that were starting before there were clinical symptoms, if we had biomarkers or tests for Alzheimer's disease, then we might be able to do trials in people that were biomarker positive. And lots of us hope that there will be such biomarkers. This is a hypothetical construct generated by Clifford Jack, but most of us think something like this is true. So if you start with the red bar here, this is the clinical symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, very mild in the mild cognitive impairment, increasing rapidly as the, over the next few years of dementia. If you're really, really clever, you use perhaps computerized tests, you can pick up maybe a few months to a year earlier some cognitive deterioration that is not quite dementia. This is the mild cognitive impairment that we try and look at in the clinic now. And this increases a little bit before the full symptoms of dementia. If you use different tests of brain imaging, you might be able to pick, and I'll show you some data that suggests we might be able to pick up some of the pathological processes a little bit earlier. But the hope is if we look at pathology, this is meant to indicate tau-mediated pathology, synaptic dysfunction, or amyloid accumulation. If we had tests for these, we might be able to identify people that had pathological change many years, perhaps a decade or more, before they had symptoms. So the two biomarkers that are most advanced that are looking for this preclinical pathological staging, if you like, are these. Lumbar puncture to deliver CSF in which you can measure biochemically amyloid and tau or PET imaging by which you can measure amyloid. So this is an amyloid, it's actually a PIB scan that can measure amyloid aggregation and there are many other um, PET scans being developed um, that would be early indicators and this is commercially very important and you may have read some of you in the news I think it was just last week the first of these is approaching approval by the FDA now now both of these are very good tests both of these deliver what we want in terms of very early detection still more work to be done to see how they function in the real world but there are problems with these tests and the problems are for spinal tap to get CSF it's not painful but it's uncomfortable and one in a hundred people get a headache uh, sufficiently severe that you at least have to provide for approximately one in a hundred people to have an overnight stay in hospital that has a cost attached to it it's not an inconsiderable cost actually um, but also if you want to do that spinal tap again and again and again over a period of a year or two and you're thinking about the population that is at risk of Alzheimer's disease, so elderly and frail people, you can see, I think, the problem. It's not optimal. Possible, but not optimal. PET scanning is fantastic. It's very specific, we think, and more work being done, but there aren't that many of the world's population that are close enough to a cyclotron to have PET imaging. So even as we move from very short half-life radioligands with C11 to longer half-life radioligands using F18, which is what's being developed now and was in the papers last week, it still requires you to be a certain distance from a PET imaging unit, and there aren't that many even in a country such as the UK. It's also rather expensive, some thousands of pounds per test. So great advances, and there will be, I think, particular perhaps niche uses for these tests but when we started to become involved in the biomarker field maybe eight years ago we decided to look at technologies that were more applicable to an elderly population that live at home still so we decided to see if we could find a blood-based biomarker and if we could turn MRI imaging, which is becoming um, a normal test, if you like, a normal part of the examination, if we could turn that into a quantitative biomarker. So I'll first explain some of the work that Andy Simmons and my other colleagues uh, have been doing and many other labs around the world to try and turn an MRI exam, which is currently done 
in order to look for space occupying lesions, cancer basically is to try and exclude other causes of the, of the symptoms of dementia, to try and turn that into a quantitative test. So using computer analysis of the MR scan, you can parcelate the brain. You know the brain's not that colour, don't you? <laughs> You can parcelate the brain up into its different regions and you can measure the volume of each one of these and the thickness of the grey matter. And you can do this in an automated fashion. And it's very satisfying to me because it's always struck me as slightly odd that we put the patient into the scanner. The scanner delivers essentially binary code. It delivers numbers. And we turn those numbers, that digital data, into an analogue signal, a photograph, in order for people like me to be able to understand it. And we look at the photograph and we say, do you know, I'm not sure, it might look a bit abnormal. And then we have a little bit of an argument about it and ignore it. And that's what actually happens to MR scans once we've decided there's no other major pathology in the brain. But the data is there, it's digital. So using the algorithms that Andy Simmons, Sergi costa Phaedra, and many others have developed, we can turn this into a set of numbers, in fact over 70 variables, and we can then compare people with Alzheimer's disease to unaffected individuals. The red triangles are people with Alzheimer's disease, the black are unaffected individuals, and you can see the MR scan alone, when analysed digitally, is not bad at distinguishing these two groups. Of course, what we don't know is the MR scanner may be actually even better than the clinicians that are making the decision. We have to wait a while till we find that out. But this is becoming a little powerful uh, technique, and it turns out that it's not bad at distinguishing preclinical disease as well. So much so that we've introduced this now into routine clinical practice. So we've incorporated the algorithm, we've got a computer, probably the largest computer behind the NHS firewall that analyzes the scans. And if you come for an assessment of dementia in South London, as a routine now, you have automated analysis of your MR scan. And I predict that this will become the norm within a very short period of time. There's no reason why we shouldn't roll this out as an adjunct to clinical diagnosis. It's just using the data that we use now visually in a more effective way. But in itself, it's not good enough. So the really hard question is, can you find a blood test for Alzheimer's disease? Well, I mean, why would you have a blood test for Alzheimer's disease? The brain is protected from the blood. So when we started off, we thought that we'd be looking for the null hypothesis. We thought we would be looking to prove that you couldn't have a blood test for Alzheimer's disease, so we could all go on and do something more productive. But actually, we proved ourselves wrong. So I haven't got time to tell you much of the work that we've been doing over the past uh, nearly decade now. But let me just show you one experiment because I think there's an interesting issue here that has wider implications in Alzheimer's disease. I told you that there is a long preclinical period. So very large numbers of elderly people have absolutely no symptoms. It's not that they've been misdiagnosed. They literally have no symptoms, undiscoverable, because they're not there. But they have pathology in their brain. So up to a third of the people we think of as normal controls actually have Alzheimer's disease. Now, we have an experiment then when we're comparing people with Alzheimer's disease to people we think have no Alzheimer's disease, our normal controls, but a third of our normal controls have the same as the, that's not a good experiment. I learned when I was doing my GCSEs that picking the control, the fair test, is the most important part of an experiment. And we're not very good at doing it in Alzheimer's disease, so we thought quite hard about how to solve that conundrum. And in this experiment, I think this is the first example of using this approach. In this experiment, we didn't have anybody that we knew was not or we thought was normal. Everybody in this experiment had Alzheimer's disease. And we took some of the people with Alzheimer's disease and we divided them up according to how much pathology they had as measured on the MR scan. And in the other people, we divided them up into how much pathology we thought they had clinically into those people who were declining rapidly and those people who were declining slowly. We were thinking these people have more pathology than these, 
those people who had more atrophy had more pathology than those who didn't. And then we did a proteomics experiment. So we did a 2D gel electrophoresis experiment. Basically, you separate the proteins in blood in two dimensions, and you have, in effect, a protein fingerprint that looks more or less the same in everybody, but using image analysis, you can compare your two groups and come up with a set of proteins that seem, or a set of spots, that seem to reflect the difference between those with small amounts of pathology to those with large amounts of pathology. We then use tandem mass spectrometry in spots that we cut out of this to identify those proteins. And we said that our a priori criteria for finding a biomarker is that anything that came out of both of these experiments we would expect to correlate with the amount of atrophy in the brain, correlate with memory loss or cognitive impairment, and correlate with speed of decline. We only found one protein that met those criteria. It's a protein called clustrin. So we published that. And then we had some additional data that went beyond the a priori criteria. This was an interesting experiment. In this experiment, we correlated blood clustrin levels with the amount of pathology measured using that PET scan that I showed you earlier, using amyloid ligand PET imaging, so measuring the amount of amyloid in people's brain, but in normal individuals and in blood that was collected 10 years before the PET scan. So here we have a correlation of plasma clustering with your propensity to develop amyloid deposits in your brain even when you're in the normal phase of aging. So we think we've found a plasma indicator of very, very early pathology. So then we asked the hardest question of all, why? We didn't answer it, but we got some way to answering it because we turned to the mouse. And in this mouse, actually, this was an experiment in collaboration with GSK. This is the GSK mouse made by my friend and colleague, Jill Richardson. So it's the double transgenic APP presenal in one mice. Those of you who come from GSK will know it as the TAS-TPM mouse. So in the TAS-TPM mouse, at about the time they developed plaques, we took some blood samples and we found plasma clustering was higher in the mouse when they were developing plaques than in normal mice. I still find that an incredible result. When you're looking in people, people are complicated. Um, elderly people with dementia have all sorts of things wrong with them. They're taking a load of drugs, they often have other illnesses, they're frail. There could be lots of reasons why clustering goes up. But in these animals, at this stage, there's nothing wrong with them. The only change that has been induced in these animals is a transgenic change in one bit of the brain that means these animals develop plaques. But because of that, they develop peripheral increases in plasma clustering. I think that's a remarkable question. How does the signal transmit from brain to blood? We really don't know, but it's a terribly interesting question. At the time we published this data, I was also part of a huge collaboration um, between the US and the UK led by Julie Williams in Cardiff looking for genes associated with Alzheimer's disease. And this was looking at 14, 16,000 individuals, and there was another study that we were racing to beat that was led by colleagues in France. And one day, Julie, as a weekend, Julie rang me up and she said that the first analysis of the results had just come through. She'd just seen them. She wondered what I made of the genes that we were identifying as being risk genes for Alzheimer's disease. She said, I don't know whether this is interesting, but she said, um, the first gene that's associated with Alzheimer's disease after APOE is a gene called clustering. So I nearly fell over. And it's a remarkable observation that clustering was identified at the same time in completely independent studies, completely unknown to each other, as a both proteomic and a genomic marker of Alzheimer's disease using data-driven studies, not candidate studies. So at this point, we really thought we were on something. And so 
This is where we're at now. We um, have intellectual property um, on a protein panel that we're developing as potential biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. It's working in collaboration with a biotech company called Proteome Sciences. We've licensed for further development to Millipore Merck. We had a development program grant from MRC to further develop assays. We've um, developed two different kinds of assays. We've developed a Luminet XMAP panel. This is, a, if you like, a fluid phase ELISA type study. Um, and we've also developed a reaction monitoring and mass spectrometry based panel. We've completed now a study in a thousand subjects. It's a huge piece of work. I think probably the biggest biomarker study that I think is delivering qualification level data. We've completed it, but we haven't analyzed this part yet. It's in a work in progress. But we have analyzed this part, and we got the first results um, two and a half weeks ago. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, it looks like we're replicating our results in a qualification level sample. So we can see some substantial differences, and we're now further developing that with a view to going um, for the next stage, which will be a discussion with regulatory and licensing authorities. And it is true, I think, now that as a consequence of that work that I've just described in the genomics work, clustering has become one of the most interesting genes in Alzheimer's disease. And we're working as fast as we can to try and understand what the biology of clustering is in relation to dementia. But understanding this may, as I think indicating, yield us new clues to disease pathogenesis that might help further drug development. So it's not just clustering that's in our panel. Um, using both the genomics and the proteomics, there seem to be some patterns emerging from the data that are remarkably interesting. And one of the most predominant patterns is that there's a clear aberration in complement signaling in the blood of people with Alzheimer's disease. So complement C1 and C3 are both identified through proteomics and genomics. CR1 is a major susceptibility gene that comes out of Julie and others' studies. Clustering is involved in the complement pathway, and as I say, both genomics and proteomics point to its involvement in Alzheimer's disease. And the first potential biomarker that we discovered, actually also discovered at the same time by the then extant biomarker group in uh, GlaxoSmithKline, was complement factor H. We did very similar studies at the same time, and GSK found exactly the same as us the complement factor H is a potential biomarker for Alzheimer's disease. So this is, I think, remarkable that we are beginning to identify pathways that might be involved in pathogenesis, either as primary causative or secondary causative events. And this suggests that intervening in complement signaling might be a very good therapeutic uh, step. And so as a consequence of that, we've teamed up with Pharma and are developing new therapeutics. And one of the things that interests me the most is the potential for repurposing drugs that have been developed elsewhere for other diseases for the use in Alzheimer's disease and accelerating the drug development program as a consequence. So there are many compounds under development in other areas of immunology, for example, in prevention of rejection of organ transplants. Might we be able to use some of those therapeutics in Alzheimer's disease? I think it's a very interesting question and an interesting approach to drug development. So I want to conclude by saying I think we're in a worrying stage over the next few years, but overall I'm optimistic and I think if we can hang on in there and keep researching this colossally important disease, we will be able to capitalize on 100 years of progress. Starting with Alzheimer's, Alzheimer himself, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease has now been very well described. We understand the role of plaques and tangles. We can fit those plaques and tangles into a schema, schema that is 
very widely replicated and substantiated. You can use that schema to develop novel therapeutics. We're advancing drug development by having more intelligent uh, clinical trials using biomarkers, stratification, and so on. I think, though, the challenge is, can we go earlier in the disease course, identify people in the preclinical phase that are suitable for intervention? Ultimately, our goal must be the same as Alzheimer's, and that is no more Augusta deeds. And on a sober note, I want to end with, I think we can make progress, but the progress is dependent upon money. And although there has been very considerable investment in Alzheimer's disease by the UK government and the French government, and Obama has this as a major um, focus of activity, there's still too little spent on Alzheimer's disease. So there is a really... I think sobering statistic, and that is that for every person with cancer in the UK, there's something like £280 spent on research. Whereas for every person with Alzheimer's disease, the equivalent figure is 11. I don't want to spend less money on people with Alzheimer's uh, cancer, but I would seriously like to increase the funding available for Alzheimer's disease research to even a more respectable fraction of that for people with dementia. This is the ugliest slide I'm going to show you. Um, not that lot, but that one. <laughs> so my colleagues and I, and our small contribution to raising some money, are going on a cycle ride. I'd really like to invite you to help us by sponsoring us. We're going to be cycling on the 9th of June, 100 kilometers around London, starting at midnight. It seemed a good idea at the time. It's beginning to seem an increasingly bad idea. And the two charities that we've chosen to give our money to are two local ones, the Maudsley and Guys in St. Thomas's. Those two charities have done a huge amount to provide the infrastructure for research um, that allows us to, to do many of the studies that I've described. Um, that's the thing. I've got some little pieces of paper there with the URL of how you can help us if you choose. And I want to thank, this is only a small number of the people that have done this work. These are the ones that are current in my lab at the moment and many other collaborators around the world and of course the generous funding that we have had from European funding from the NIHR in particular and also MRC Wellcome Trust and Alzheimer's Research UK as well as our local charities and thank you for your attention. Simon, that was excellent. Good to stand in the middle, we get a good picture of him. Now we take some questions, I'm sure you can. Yeah, I'm more than happy. Questions. From the lady James, front. Uh, I'm just going to ask, has anybody said anything? Wait a minute for the, the microphone. Um, Jane Plant, Imperial College. Can I just ask, has anybody done any epidemiology on this disease? For example, countries which have great longevity too, like Japan and China, is there any difference in the incidence there and is it supported that there is by migration studies? Yes, is the short answer. The longer answer is it is terribly complicated because one of the things that we know is that we only identify a relatively small fraction of the people with dementia in the community. And so the biggest variable on the numbers of people known to services says more about the services themselves than the, number, than the true prevalence in the community. And so you need to do primary epidemiology and do the door knocking and so on, and that's obviously difficult in many parts of the world. However, broadly speaking, um, Alzheimer's disease occurs everywhere. There are some subtle differences, even in Europe. So, for example, it's very, very slightly but measurably more prevalent in northern countries in Europe than in Mediterranean countries. And that more or less reflects the APOE gene distribution, which is a susceptibility gene. Um, in uh, other countries, there are, like Japan you mentioned, it's slightly lower risk, although there's a slightly increased risk of vascular dementia. That might be due to diet. One of the most curious things is that in Africa, most parts of sub-Saharan Africa, the incidence appears to be very low. And that isn't just because um, there aren't many elderly people in Africa, but it 
it might be because to become elderly in Africa, you need to be a really healthy survivor, so something quite distinct. There's one very important study that has compared Nigerians in Nigeria to Nigerian people in the US, in Indianapolis, I believe. And the risk goes up as they migrate, and it actually becomes even slightly higher than the white population in America as they acquire Western diet, presumably, or something to do with urban living. Any more questions? Professor Shaw. Robert Shaw, Berkeley College. When he put up the date, I can remember exactly where I was on the troop ship going through the Mediterranean to the Burma Front, and we didn't cheer. No. Um, I want to ask you two questions. One is a recent report that an anti-cancer drug has been useful, in mice at least, for them. On the other one, what about lifestyle changes? I mean, we know for diabetes and cardiac problems that exercise, diet, does any mental activity help to delay Alzheimer's? So your first question about the paper that was in Science about a month ago was very interesting. Uh, I, mean, I think just more research needs to be done. What I would say is that I think that there are certainly more than a dozen, maybe quite a lot more than a dozen compounds that have been shown to be efficacious in mice. One of the problems is that the animal models that are used are very good models of amyloid aggregation, but they're very, very poor models of Alzheimer's disease. For whatever reason, the mouse doesn't have that cascade that I described. So I glossed over that little problem a little. And it is a problem for the research because it means that the results in mice, it turns out, may not be easily translatable to man in this particular instance. So I think that whilst that study was very interesting and exciting, it's difficult to interpret it beyond saying, well, it does something to amyloid in mice. We really need those human studies. Your second part of the question about lifestyle, I would love to be able to say to you that uh, what you read in the papers is true and that you can do something to prevent Alzheimer's disease by mental activity, coming to lectures, um, having lots of friends, doing Sudoku or whatever it is. I'd love to be able to say that. I think the evidence is not brilliant, I have to say. There is some evidence. Actually, there's again some evidence in mice. If you take those self-same mouse models and you put the mice in an enriched environment where they have to socially interact and they're always fighting or you know, mating or doing something like that, it, it tends to reduce their uh, incidence or the, 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 the effects of the amyloid aggregation. So that's kind of promising. Um, and there's some evidence from man that educational level and activity is associated with decreased risk. But the problem with that is there are so many confounds. So people who are highly educated and people that come to lectures like this are not the same as everybody else. And so my prediction is that you are different to people watching Come Dine With Me or Cash in the Attic right now in lots of different ways um, to do with your class, your background, your lifestyle throughout the whole of your life that mean there isn't a simple equation that mental activity. Sorry? It's not the answer. It really isn't the answer. And it, I, you know, if you do Sudoku, you'll get better at Sudoku. And it's hard to say that it will do much more than that. The one caveat to that, I would say, is that the lay societies give advice, quite clear advice now, that you should eat well, you should exercise, you should eat all your greens, and prevent yourself from getting diabetes and heart disease. Now, I say that is a fantastic plan. And yes, you should eat broccoli, yes, you should exercise, and you should have a healthy lifestyle throughout your life. I think it will prevent you getting diabetes, it will prevent you from getting heart disease. Will it prevent you from getting dementia? Honestly, I, I don't know, but you know, it's better not to have diabetes and heart disease as well. Can, can I press you on, on the animal? problem issue that if we have a lot of compounds in phase three studies and all the noises are as you say that 
there doesn't look like there's going to be anything that's really going to be a breakthrough, which suggests that all of the animal studies are not going to be predictive. <coughs> How are we going to develop new agents, especially if we're going to be treating asymptomatic patients based on a biomarker strategy without any warm feeling from animal studies or without doing, God knows, 10-year outcome studies to wait to see if these patients actually develop symptoms at an enormous cost? Or would you ever get a drug like that through NICE, for example? I'll deal with the last bit first. Yes, absolutely, you would get a drug like that through um, NICE. I, I, I'm on at least two of them, uh, statins and ACE inhibitors, as I think most people uh, of 50 or thereabouts probably ought to be. And I'm wondering when I should start my aspirin. Th those are approved by NICE, even though I'm taking them now for a disease pathology I don't expect to get for another 15 or 20 years. So yes, I, I don't see that as a problem. Nor do I actually see the animal models as a problem. I think the animal models have just been overinterpreted. So what we've done is we've called them animal models of Alzheimer's disease. And that's the mistake, because they're not. They're animal models of amyloid pathology. And the bit that we didn't connect is we went from animal models of amyloid pathology to studies of Alzheimer's disease. We've never tested a drug in a model of Alzheimer's disease because we don't have them. What we should have done is we've developed potential therapeutics for amyloid pathology. So what we should do is give it to people with amyloid pathology and measure the effects on amyloid pathology. That means doing experimental medicine studies where we select people with biomarkers and then we measure outcomes using biomarkers and then we follow people up to see the clinical outcomes. That is expensive and I don't think there's any shortcut to that expense but I think it is manageable if we do the proper experimental medicine first and get our signal that we're looking for in man after we've done it in animals and that's the step we missed and it's been a multi-billion pound error, frankly. You had a question from? There's one at the back. Hello. Sorry. Uh, I have some experience of this since my mother um, has um, Alzheimer's disease, um, but she's, she is coming up to her 90th birthday next Monday, and she also has only really um, exhibited this for the last two years. Um, she's been part of one of these PET scan tests, but you've got so very little information because she's only been in it for two years, um, and all these marker things for earlier than that would seem to be very, very important. Um, uh, talking about lifestyle, I think my mother's had a pretty healthy lifestyle, Helen, would you agree? I mean, she's, she's never uh, been overweight, she's always eaten very well, and um, she's been fit and active up until now. Is it something that we should just expect in somebody who's 88 that they should ex you know, be in the early stages of Alzheimer's by then? It's I don't want to get there, please. No. Can you tell me some way of avoiding it? <laughs> well, if... I mean, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that I actually want to be 88, actually, and the way that things are going at the moment. Nobody's allowing me to say, I want to get off now. Yeah, I mean, in all seriousness, that's only the, the only effective way of avoiding it, is yes. just don't get old. But, um, th so this is quite complicated, but th there is a debate that goes on, is, is Alzheimer's disease a disorder of aging, or is it an age-related disorder? And by that I mean, if it was a disorder of aging, then it's something that's going to, it's just a consequence of longevity and it will affect all of us if we live long enough. And then the only question becomes, how long can we live? You know, if we all live to 120, would we all have it? Uh, whereas if it was a disorder of aging, uh, sorry, if it was an age-related disorder, then there would be a period when you were vulnerable. And it just so happens that that period is in very, very late life. So in order to answer that question, which is a serious question that people try and ask, is to look at the incidence, new cases of Alzheimer's disease in the very, very elderly. Your mother would be young for these kind of studies, so in centenarians and above. And there have been a number of studies that have done that with distressingly contrary results. 
and obviously they're difficult studies to do because there aren't so many people and I can never remember which way round it is but the incidence in either men or women continues to increase after the age of 100 which suggests it's a disorder of aging uh, whereas the incidence in the other gender whichever it is begins to go down after the age of 100 suggesting it's an age-related disorder with the period of risk being 60 to 70 up to 80 to 90 we simply don't know at the moment um, but even if it was a disorder of aging I don't see any reason to think that it isn't preventable because the pathology is a discrete pathology it's not things just wearing out and dropping off there is an actual discrete pathology it's plaques and tangles and there's no conceptual reason why we shouldn't prevent those plaques and tangles so I think that it is absolutely conceivable that we could do what is called secondary prevention so pick up people with the very earliest signs in the brain before they ha have symptoms prevent those pathologies from accelerating and keep people alive without symptoms for long enough until they die of something else now you will know from your mother that every six months when you're 91 becomes colossally valuable and important and if we could prevent that pathology from having a clinical effect in people aged 80 90 and above then we would in effect abolish this scourge of aging I think it is at least conceivable we have a question at the back there. yes thank you I must say when I came in and saw May the 8th 1945 and actually remembering going to those celebrations I thought there was something terrible that if you were alive then then Alzheimer's was about to hit you so I'm slightly encouraged it was something different you mentioned at some stage during the, t the tau uh, phosphorylation and inhibitors and so on GSK3 and you mentioned lithium that is surprisingly simple molecule with lithium in it I think I just wondered, maybe you can't say exactly what it is, but is it a really simple lithium compound, like a lithium salt, or is it lithium buried in a very big molecule? I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah, so, so the GSK3 inhibitors uh, that have been developed by companies uh, have no relationship to lithium. So lithium works as an, my understanding, uh, this is a dangerous thing to say in, in the Royal Society of Chemistry, but my understanding of how lithium is thought to work in uh, inhibiting the action of GSK3 is it displaces magnesium from the core of the enzyme but the GSK3 inhibitors that have been generated there's a whole raft of them have entirely different actions um, as small molecules in inhibiting GSK3 right, so it was a lithium salt maybe that was added and did this uh, elision or whatever or so, the yeah, so the lithium that is given to patients with bipolar disorder manic depression is a lithium salt uh, lithium carbonate or lithium chloride and it's given to millions of patients yes that, that was the only thing I can remember that lithium did years ago yes. this thing about manic depression yes and, and it, you know it's it's a very effective um, drug to prevent relapse of bipolar disorder right, and there's this connection here again thank you Yes, yes, as you will, and it, you know, one of the side, it does have side effects, as you'll know. You have to keep within a therapeutic range, which is rather tight, so she'll have to have regular blood tests. And one of the side effects is diabetes insipidus, which can happen, and there, there are others. But so long as you stay in the therapeutic window, it's relatively safe drug. There is a there is a question that I thought you were going to raise that follows immediately, which is very relevant to your daughter, and that is people that have taken lithium over a lifetime what is their incidence of Alzheimer's disease there have been two or three studies that have looked at this with not not entirely consistent results but this but um, I think if there is a consistency for instance a study from an old research fellow or previous research fellow of mine in Brazil and there are similar studies from China that have compared people with bipolar disorder who've taken lithium to people with bipolar disorder who've taken sodium valproate and then followed them to the age at which they're at risk of dementia the people that have taken lithium have less Alzheimer's disease than those that have taken sodium valproate 
and this uh, Orestes Falenza, who used to work with me, then went on and did a one-year clinical trial, not an efficacy trial, but it's an early clinical trial of lithium in people with very early Alzheimer's disease and MCI, looked at the spinal fluid CSF test that I showed you, and there's an indication that people who take lithium have less cognitive deterioration in that trial and have decreased amounts of tau, so an indicator of less pathology. I think that's very promising myself. You have none at the front? Uh, so you have shown that, uh, you have shown that uh, tau uh, protein phosphorylation is the, is the cause that uh, forms the, or causes the formation of the tangles, and that is the main uh, factor that provokes the, the disease. But then you, you have showed as well that the, all the GSK uh, inhibitors so far have failed in the clinical trials. So how do you explain one thing with the other? Is it really that the, the tau phosphorylation is not a real cause of the disease, or is it just the drugs that are not effective enough? So sadly, the GSK3 inhibitors have not yet gone to clinical trial. So, that, so if I suggested they had, uh, I was not meaning to suggest that. What I was suggesting is they're part of the drug development programs. So there are a number of companies that are doing um, GSK3 trials. Um, there is a Spanish company that is doing that has phase two trials that are underway. Again, we're we're part of that trial. Uh, we're the leading UK site, but it's happening all over the world. And of course, we don't know the results because everybody's still blinded to that. But that's even phase two, so it's only an early indicator. Some of the other programs of GSK3 inhibitors in some other companies have been stopped because of worries of toxicity. So GSK3 sig signaling is at the core of multiple signaling routes, pathways. So as a target for therapy, it's a tough target because you would predict toxicity. And in some of the uh, preclinical animal models, that's what they got. And so the, nonetheless, there are some GSK3 inhibitors that are just going into man. In our own research now, we are saying, okay, so GSK3 is a great target in a biological sense, but it might not be the best of targets in a pharmaceutical sense because of worries about toxicity. So we're now trying to flesh out that pathway, if you like, from amyloid to GSK3 to understand the molecular detail, and we've initiated a drug discovery program based on other targets uh, at different points in that pathway. Any more? Yes, this lady in the middle there. Um, do we know anything about the functional purpose of tau phosphorylation in fetuses? In in what? Sorry. Fetuses. So, <coughs> tau phosphorylation. It, it's tau phosphorylation. Um, changes not only in the fetus but in in adults uh, over you know very quickly uh, in your brain. Um, so in fetus, the assumption is that tau is highly phosphorylated because it doesn't need, if you like, you know, I mean, one is a, need is not quite the right word, but you know what I mean. It doesn't need to bind to microtubules really well because a fetus isn't thinking, essentially. It's got a developing neuron. The developing neuron characteristics are very different to an adult neuron. In an adult neuron, you want stability. In a developing neuron, you want flexibility. And so when the fetus is in development stage, tau phosphorylation is entirely appropriate. There's a, I, th I think it's a very interesting question, though, about the regulation of uh, GSK3 phosphorylation of tau in the adult. So we um, decided to look at that using the paradigm of long-term potentiation. And to cut a very long story short, long-term potentiation is probably the best cellular model of memory that we have, and it works. We've got a few minutes to explain. Sure. So long-term potentiation works by, if you take a neuron, you can do this in a Petri dish, or you can do it in an intact animal, and it's true for lots of different species. You take a neuron, and you give it an electrical input, you can measure the output of the neuron, the electrical output of the neuron. And you get a certain quantum of output. And if you give that neuron a really strong input, actually a titanic input like that, you get a big output. And if you then give the neuron 
another single shot, you still get a big output. So it's as though the neuron has remembered that it's had a big input. And that memory within a single neuron decays over about two to three hours. So that's why it's called long-term, two to three hours, and it's potentiation, because you've got a potentiated response. And what we discovered um, was that GSK3 and the phosphorylation of tau is absolutely critical to that process. So the take-home message from the experiment, the strap line, if you like, is that in order to have long-term potentiation, you need to inhibit GSK3. So we think GSK3 is something of a memory molecule, and that as you are encoding memories, a process similar to long-term potentiation is happening, and in doing so, one of the molecular events that's happening within the cell is an inhibition of GSK3, a transient inhibition of tau phosphorylation. There's an exact opposite to long-term potentiation called long-term depression. And Graham Collingridge and his group from Bristol, at the same time as we found our effect, they found an exact opposite on long-term de depression. So they found that you depress neurons' ability to remember if you increase GSK3 activity. So I think that as we think and we remember things, then we are going through a process of second to second, minute to minute, inhibition of GSK3, the memory molecule. Sorry, that was quite a long answer to a short question. I have Walt, oh, I we have a question at the back. I actually have two questions, but they're quite short. Um, the first one is, is tau phosphorylation reversible, at least in vitro? And secondly, you said there was no good animal models. Um, does that mean also that some higher mammals don't get Alzheimer's, or do you see it in chimps? So the, the, I have a very short answer to the first question and a longer answer to the second question, which perhaps we can come back to at tea afterwards, because I have a theory about that. So the, the first question, yes, tau phosphorylation is reversible. Um, even tau aggregation in animal models appears to be at least partially reversible and has been reversed with lithium. So that's very promising, I think. Um, the answer to your second question is, is really interesting, I think. Do animals ha get Alzheimer's disease? It turns out that more or less they don't. It, there is no... It's not entirely true. There's a small colony of very, very aged macaques, I think, somewhere near Montpellier, <laughs> that have some of the symptoms and some of the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. But more or less, it's true that Alzheimer's disease doesn't seem to occur in animals. And the most important animal, of course, is the mouse. Because as we've been discussing, you can fill a mouse brain with amyloid and it doesn't get tangles. So you can work really, really hard to give a mouse Alzheimer's disease and it doesn't. Here's my theory, very briefly. Man is a phenomenally unusual animal. We live three times our reproductive life. So reproduction gets harder and harder after the age of about 30. If we were an animal, that would be our lifespan. And we live three or four times our normal natural reproductive. We're not entirely unique in the animal kingdom, but we're nearly unique in an animal kingdom. So mice will reproduce quite effectively up to more or less the day they drop down dead. So there's something different between us and, and, and mice. Now, if you want to make a mouse or a fly or a worm live three times longer than its natural lifespan. You can do that. You can do that by perturbing almost any gene in the insulin signaling pathway. It's quite remarkable. You can make mice live three times as long as they normally do by perturbing the insulin receptor substrates, for example. Some people think that we then might have the potential of making man live three times longer than we normally do. We could live to be 300. I think that is sorely mistaken. I think it's already happened. I think, and I'm serious about this, I think something, my theory is that something in our evolutionary history perturbed our insulin signaling pathway so that it's not very effective and as a consequence we live three times longer than we should. 
by reproductive life. What does insulin do? Insulin inhibits GSK3. That's why it's called glycogen synthase kinase 3. So I think that it was a natural accident in our evolutionary history that is nearly exclusive to Homo sapiens. That means we live three times longer than any other animal relative to our reproductive life. And as a consequence, the price we pay, not just because we're old, but because of this biological pathway, is diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. Any more questions? I think we've probably come to an end. I think the, uh, <coughs> the response from the audience shows that, of course, everybody's interested in this because none of them want to get it. And as I said at the beginning, I think... Um, most people have uh, come in contact with friends and relatives and know just how, what a, a terrible uh, condition it is. But Simon, that, that was excellent. Thank you very much. It's indeed. a pleasure.